spot. Hello, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. Today we're going to build this. Well, I've already built it. I'm going to show you me building this. It's a ZX emulator, which is a ZX Spectrum emulator. It's an upgrade on the one we built recently because it has a joystick part as well as some other improvements. That's about it. Let's get on with it. So this is the Mermulator version 1.1, which we built in the previous video. If you haven't seen the video, go and check it out. Otherwise, here's a quick recap of what it is. As you can see, it is based on a Raspberry Pi Pico, which is built around an RP2040 chip. The firmware is designed to emulate the ZX Spectrum, and the board has been built around it to give the usual inputs and outputs, which you might expect from a modern ZX Spectrum. So on this version we had a VGA or HDMI out, room for a PS2 keyboard, audio sockets for the mic and ear ports, and an SD card built in for loading games. It is possible to connect a joystick to the 1.1 with some bodgy soldering, but the new version 1.4 has a built-in joystick port, so I'm going to build one of them now. Here are the PCBs which I ordered from PCBWay. I ordered a few of them so I'm going to have some spares, I might give them away. This time I went for a red PCB, I don't know why, I just fancied having a red one. As you can see the board is very similar to the 1.1, there's a cutaway there where the joystick part goes and I'm going to have a close up of that in a second. What about the case, these are also from PCBWay's 3D printing service. I downloaded the files directly from the Mermulator website, there were a few options for the 1.4. I went for this one because it has a cool blockbuster style pattern on the top. It looks like it goes together fairly easily, there's space on the sides for all your ports and things like that. Possibly I've put this in the wrong way around, we'll see when we come to assemble it how it goes together. This was built out of PLA using an FDM process, I didn't specify any surface finish and I chose green. I'm no 3D printing expert, but I'm very happy with the quality and the service which PCBWay provided. Here's another close up of the finish, this time on a completely flat piece. Okay, back to the board then, let's have a little look around at the improvements that have been made to the 1.4 version of the Mermulator. It's not marked on the silk screen, but this PS2 part here now has room to be a USB port instead. So I'm going to get a standard USB A connector and solder it in there. I don't have to mess around with PS2 keyboards. This is where our nine way D type joystick connector is going to go. There are five pads on the top and four on the bottom and it's just going to straddle the edge of the board. We'll solder it directly to those pads there. There's also room for a USB connector on the underside of the board here. Now this is a USB-C I think I'm going to go for, and what it does is it allows you to power the board while leaving the USB port on the Pico open. The board also accommodates a PS RAM chip. PS RAM is pseudo static RAM, it's dynamic RAM that behaves statically because it has a self refresh. This will give the Pico an extra 64 megabits of memory. Over here we can see two overlapping footprints for different kinds of audio chip. On this side of the board, you can put a CS4334 or a CS4344. On the top side of the board, you could choose to use a TDA1387 chip. I think you have to pick one out of these three to go with. They're all DACs or uh, digital analog converters. I've had to learn a little bit about them to understand what they do. As with the previous board, this board allows you to use SMD or through hole parts for the vast majority of the smaller components on the board. For these small passives, I'm going to be using SMD chips and hand soldering them just for practice. So don't expect a perfect job here, I'm going to be hopefully improving along the way. Here's the strategy I'm going to use to solder these small parts, which are 0805 packages by the way. I'm going to put flux down, I'm going to pre-tin the end of my solder tip, I'm using a chisel tip. I'm going to put the component in place. This is an 0603 size, I didn't have the right size for this, but it's going to fit. Then I'm just going to touch the tin solder tip down into the flux so it all fizzles away and makes the joint. What we'll find as we make our way through is that I tend to put a bit too much solder on. Although the joints are made, it looks a little bit messy. I think that might be down to the tip being quite large and quite rounded. Um, I'm going to order some different tips and try them later on in the video, but for now we'll persevere on with this tip. 
and I'll be using lots of flux along the way. And there's the first part fitted. I'm going to whiz through the rest of the surface mount small passive components, plenty of them to go with. By the way, these unmarked resistors are the right way up. They're all white on the bottom, which at least makes me confident that I know I'm putting them on the right way. As you can see, I ran into problems with them not being flat to the board with this particular soldering method, so obviously not doing it quite as well as I could be. I went round all of the ones which I could see were slightly lifted and pushed them down, reheated with the iron or the hot air, and where the joints might have been affected by me reseating them, I added a little bit more flux and got the iron back on there to make sure the joints were good. Overall, I think this method of soldering is definitely faster than using the hot air, but obviously messier, at least at the moment, maybe with a bit more practice and maybe with a smaller tip. The end result might look a little bit more professional, but anyway, I know it's going to work. I've made all the joints, I haven't made any shorts, and we can move on to the more interesting components. Just having a close up look at this tip, I can see that where the pads are very small, I'm going to struggle to apply heat directly to it. I definitely need solder in there to conduct the heat to make the joint. So maybe pre-tinning one of the pads might have helped, or maybe I need to be feeding a bit more solder in off the spool while I'm heating it. Still refining this technique, and I appreciate all of your constructive criticism in the comments, thank you very much. Anyway, that's enough faffing around with tips. Let's get this job finished and move on to something a bit more interesting. Well, this is the audio DAC digital analog converter chip which I bought and I seem to have inadvertently bought the smallest possible choice of the three I could have put on this board. As you can see, the pins are about the width of one of the ridges on my fingerprint. So this could well be the smallest part I've ever soldered onto a board, but I'm not too worried. I think with the hot air method, it's gonna be fairly simple, thanks to the microscope. So there's a bit of solder paste put on, just poking it into place. We'll heat it up and it will melt into place really nicely. I've left a couple of solder bridges there and I'm not going to lie, I struggled to remove them even with adding flux and using smaller solder tips. In the end, I went for the wick and then made the joints again by adding a bit of flux and heating with a tip just to make sure that all the joints were made. Happy with that. I think that's pretty good. Moving on. This is the PS RAM chip, which now looks massive after having soldered that audio chip on. This is going to give the Pico a little bit extra RAM, which I guess some of these firmwares are going to take advantage of. So I've made the uh, joints using hot air and I'm just touching them up with some flux and the iron. By the way, these were the first PCBs I've ever ordered myself. So if you're interested, if you're thinking of getting into it yourself, this is how they come. At least this is how they came from PCBWay, who was sponsoring the video today. They also sent me some freebies, which I want to show you because they're really useful. Check this out as well as some stickers and bits and bobs, they sent me these guides, these little PCBs, the kind of reference guides, as well as being a rule. They've got example footprints of all different packages of components all over them. And that's useful and also just kind of nice to, to have. It's been quite a nice little piece of kit. Lots of referencing on here, different measurements and different footprints and different packages, different hole sizes. The SMD tape part counter along the top there was the tool I never knew I needed and it's already coming useful. And check this out, I'm glad I'm not soldering any 01005 parts. So yeah, go check out PCBWay, see what they can do for you. Next up is the micro SD card slot. This has these two handy little buttons on there in the plastic which align it really nicely onto the PCB and the PCB designer has thoughtfully included those two holes to make lining this thing up a lot easier than it could be. So I've put it in there, I've made the joints just using hot air and paste, and now I'm just touching them up with the flux and the iron. Sorry, I forgot to film the actual soldering of that part. Anyway, moving on, this is the HDMI port. This has a lot of pins, all very small and very close together, but following the same processes we have been, it shouldn't be too much of a problem for us. In fact, same as the last Mermulator we built, I'm just going to drag solder this into place. I had real trouble aligning the pins last time, so I'm going to solder the surface mount pins first, bracing for some criticism, but this seems to be an easier way to keep things in line. Uh, I What I did was I tacked it on on the right hand side there, added a load of flux, put some solder onto my iron, and I'm just dragging it backwards and forwards. 
I have put too much on and there's lots of bridges so I'm going to drag it around, spread the solder out and try and remove those bridges. Some of them wouldn't come out so I had to use the wick again and whenever I use the wick I'm going to put a little bit more flux on and get the iron involved again just to make sure all of the joints are good. Visually this is looking good, it looks like we've got all of the bridges off, just about, just a couple there to go. But lifting it up and looking underneath, no we're way off, there's another four bridges there to sort out. So don't forget to have a look underneath the component as well if you're soldering one of these HDMI ports on, tidying those up and we have a good connection. Now we just need to solder the four corners and we'll be finished with the HDMI port. Now for this USB-C port, this is only used for powering the device if you don't want to use the USB port on the Pico. The USB-C port went on with no problems, same as the HDMI port. And now moving on to the headers, there's a load of headers to do so let's whiz through those, get them out of the way. All I did was make sure that they were all straight and flush to the board. There's a couple of through hole electrolytic capacitors to go on. I've got plenty of them in stock from the Speccy repairs, so let's solder them in. And now what about the joystick port? This is a standard uh, nine way D type and it took me a while to find the right one actually on Mouser. I'm just not that good at filtering down the results to what I wanted. Anyway, it's going to straddle the side of the board here and it fits on really, really snug, which is really handy. It's absolutely on there and it's perfectly lined up. So this is going to be really easy to fit. It took me a while to find the right controller to order for this because a standard Kempston one won't work without some modifications. They're all designed to work with Dendi controllers, which are like NES controllers. I think they're kind of clone NES machines. Anyway, I found one eventually and it's on its way in the post. Half the difficulty in finding it was that the connector is not a standard NES connector, so you need a NES clone controller with a 9-way D-type connector on the end. But hopefully the one I've found is going to work. I need to mount the Pico on headers like this in order for the port, the USB port, to line up with the opening in the case. I'm just going to check that it does line up by popping the top half of the case on and having a look. And yeah, there it is, that's about right. I might need to shave away a little bit from the bottom side of the opening, but these headers will do the job. Let's solder them into place. I actually had a couple of capacitors left to go on, I was waiting for them to arrive, these 10 microfarad ones, and they sent me some free zero ohm resistors, basically jumpers. It's a nice touch, isn't it? So here's the finished thing. This is the Mermulator version 1.4 all built up. I'm going to plug it in, install some firmware and have a go with it. First one I picked was the ZX Spec EP firmware. As you can see, the PS RAM is working. We've got extra RAM, so that chip that I found on AliExpress has actually done the job. Wonderful. Here's something I wanted to try. I wanted to try a 512k demo. So this is the Simon's Cat demo. It's called Butterflies. And it's just a Simon's Cat cartoon, but it is 512 kilobytes and it works. One of the firmwares is capable of emulating a Pentagon 512k, which is the same as the Nucleon that we built in the other video series. And you can run 512k demos, which is absolutely brilliant. And what about the joystick? So here's the joypad that I bought. It's a Dendi joypad. Looks like a NES joypad. It fits. It's a 9-way D-type. It's got four buttons, a start and a select, and a D-pad. It cost like basically pennies, so the quality isn't fantastic, but it works. I did have to take it apart and put it back together again to stop it from pressing buttons I didn't want it to press, but it works. So I'm going to show you how you can use it with, in this case, the TechnoCat firmware. Look in the bottom right, there's a little joypad there, and I'm using a button combination on the joypad to change the mode. You can have it to be emulated as a Kempston joystick, that's this mode, or cursors or Sinclair joystick, and you can just press the buttons on the joypad to switch between those modes to minimize how much you need to lean in and use the keyboard. Let's pick the Treasure Island Dizzy tap file, go to the tape loader, and it loads. Here we are, this is Treasure Island Dizzy. I think I do have to lean over and press K to choose Kempston mode, but now I'm working happily using the joypad as a Kempston emulated joystick. Perfect. 
You can also access the firmware's menu system using the joypad and navigate it using the joypad, so the use of the keyboard is really minimised. You can't get away from it completely, but it's really convenient to use. Now I'm going to put it in the case. So I've built it up here and I can see that it's not going to work as it is. Obviously this has been designed for a VGA socket instead of HDMI and the HDMI connector won't go in. So I've been around with the scalpel and shaved all the connector holes so I can fit everything in, screwed it all together and I'm going to try and get everything plugged in now and hopefully I won't have to open it up again until I want to make some mods or if the Pico packs in. So the HDMI cable fits, the USB fits. Oh, um, I'm not going to be able to access the USB-C power port unless I cut a new hole in the case. That's one small downside of this particular case. But as you can see, everything goes in, it looks nice and neat, and I quite like the funky hexagon blockbusters case design. So if you'll excuse me, I'm going to play some more Treasure Island Dizzy, and I'll see you around for the next video. As a reward for sticking around till the end, if you want a PCB, I've got four spares. Drop me an email and we'll work out getting one to you. First four to get in touch, we'll get one. Cheers.